I would like to introduce our guest uh, for the inaugural Moody Women in Aviation Week, Colonel Danielle Wilkes. Colonel Wilkes has over 2,000 flying hours and conducted aerial combat operations over Operation Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. Colonel Wilkes started her career after obtaining her commission from the University of Michigan, ROTC. Go Blue. Go Blue. And then from there, she completed joint undergraduate navigator training and flew F-15Es as the weapon system officer before attending specialized undergraduate pilot training. Colonel Willis went on to pilot F-16s for a number of years before transitioning to serving as an air liaison officer and supporting ground operations. Colonel Willis is now the commander of the 93rd AGAO Air Ground Operations Wing, where she leads three groups with over 2,800 battlefield airmen across 20 CONUS locations. Ma'am, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Of course, we're very excited. Uh, this is obviously a very big week that we're starting here at Moody, and I think we're very lucky to have someone like yourself participate. So once again, we all appreciate this. Um, let's uh, just jump into some of these questions that we already have made out. As it says here, and you know, you have done it all from air to ground, uh, but what made you join the Air Force in the first place? So there were two main drivers. First of all, I wanted to fly and I wanted to serve my country. So I grew up with a very strong background of service and I was a Girl Scout for 12 years and volunteering and really putting myself out there was something that was really important to me. And uh, I always had a love of aviation. And in my family, there's a, a famous photo of when I was three years old at an air show sitting in the cockpit of an aircraft with a huge smile on my face and a big thumbs up. And I've known since then that that's what I wanted to do with my life. That is really cool, especially with this background story too. He's sitting there in a cockpit three years old. So obviously that played into a lot. Mm -hmm. And let's talk more about that as well. So as we heard from your bio, you moved around a lot and gained a lot of really good experience across uh, the years too. But what was your motivation to become a weapon system officer out of ROTC? And then also how did that transition into becoming the commander of the 93rd AGAL? Yeah, so like you said, it, it's kind of a long, interesting story, and I have an unusual Air Force career, if you take a look at it. Uh, when I was in ROTC at the University of Michigan, like I said, I always wanted to fly, and I wanted to fly fighters. I had no idea until I actually got commissioned that women weren't allowed to fly fighters until the, um, the Combat Exclusion Act of 1994 was repealed. And so I was lucky enough to know it, it wasn't not an option for me uh, until I actually had the, the chance to go to flight school. When I was in ROTC, I was trying to get into pilot training and um, you know, just like sometimes admin mistakes happen in the Air Force, there was a, a typo on my physical that made it appear that my eyesight wasn't good enough to go to pilot training. So I was classified for navigator school, uh, but luckily still had the opportunity to go fly a fighter. So I went down there, I worked as hard as possible at the same time, I applied to the board for correction military records to see if I could get my record to catch up to what was actually going on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I finished navigator school. I had an opportunity to fly in the F-15E and the Bold Tigers from Mountain Home Air Force Base. Uh, and then after a couple of years, I applied to pilot training and was lucky enough to be able to fly F-16s out of pilot training. So two assignments in F-16s, one at Osan Air Base in Korea and one at um, Spangdalem Air Base in Germany. Mm. Fantastic opportunity. And uh, then from there I went to be a T-38 instructor pilot at Vance Air Force Base in Oklahoma. So kind of back to the cradle of aviation, teaching students how to fly. And uh, from there, it was a time in the Air Force we were, we were restructuring and they had shut down several F-16 squadrons. So as my husband, who was also an F-16 pilot, and I were, were looking for what our next assignment was going to be. Uh, he came home one day and said, hey, you know what? They're looking for good officers in the TACP career field. They need air liaison officers down at Fort Hood. I think we should volunteer because I think you would love the mission. So we did. We got down there, and he was right. I absolutely fell in love with the TACP mission. Spent four years at Fort Hood, and he and I were actually squadron commanders right next door to each other. Um, wow. And then from there, I went to the AOC at Ramstein, so I got to see the next level up of command and control. And then I was selected for school and selected uh, for promotion to colonel. Came here after that as the 93rd Air Ground Operations Wing Vice Commander, and then I took over command this summer. So I really have had the experience of close air support and that combat mission 
from cradle to grave in every level of operations. That is extremely cool. And I really liked how you mentioned specifically too, that when you were going from weapon systems officer to pilot, something in my head that stuck was that while you loved your assignment as a weapon systems officer, it sounds like you just kept your eye on the prize of what you've always wanted. So doing your best in that position, but still thinking ahead of, hey, you want what you want, you went out for it too. Absolutely, never give up. That's that's great, man. Um, and congratulations on your, your assignment here too, Moody. Thank you. Um, so talking about flying, what would you say is your best memory? So that's a hard one, because there's a lot of really, really good ones. Um, I'll say, when I'm, uh, when I'm thinking about combat missions, my very first combat mission, uh, the, the transition from being nervous about the sortie and getting in the cockpit with butterflies in my stomach, and then once we got airborne and we were kind of in the action, everything just got calm. And I knew that my training was exactly what I needed. Everything kicked in and we had a very smooth and very successful sortie when we landed. That's probably one of my, my best and it gave me a lot of confidence to know that I could do what I needed to do when it came down to the wire. Uh, but in terms of just pure love of aviation, you know, I have some great memories across the board. The first time I did a pond crossing in the F-15E, which is flying across the Atlantic, uh, we were on our way to our first deployment. There were thunderstorms over the North Atlantic um, and we were headed into lodges in the middle of the night on the tanker, which is almost a nightmare scenario sometimes. Uh, but we started getting a phenomenon in the, the cockpit called St. Elmo's Fire. And so the entire cockpit just lit up in this blue and green light. And it was just amazing to see. And uh, something I never would have been able to experience if I wasn't in an aircraft. But probably my best and favorite memory was the, the first day that I got to solo the F-16. And uh, it's really hard to put into words how awesome that feels. But I was at uh, Luke Air Force Base for my FTU training. And um, we started our course in July. So by the time I got to solo, it was early August. So if you can imagine Arizona in August, it's pretty hot out on the ramp. Um, and uh, you know, so by the time you get dressed in your G suit and your harness and you got all your stuff and going out there, do my pre-flight of the aircraft, getting in, it was hot. I was sweating, I was stressed. Um, and, you know, got the aircraft started, got uh, the canopy lowered, I'm following my flight lead out to the runway and, and thinking, wow, I'm, this is a thing, I'm really going to be able to do this. Um, and, and at that time, you know, we're flying formation, so we did a, uh, a 10 second trail departure. So he rolled down the runway first and then 10 seconds later I got to release my brakes and go. And, um, you know, as you're sitting there waiting for your takeoff to start. You do enhance signals between the two of you. I've got my aircraft at, at full power. I'm holding the brakes until it's my turn to go. And then when I got to release the brakes, that rush of speed as I start going down the runway, and then I get to rotation speed and just pull back slightly on the stick because it's it's so responsive. And the, the point at which my tires left the ground and I was airborne and I started retracting that gear was just an unbelievable feeling. And I just took a second, it's like time stopped. I just took a second and looked around and I was like, I get to do this for a living. And this is amazing. That's probably my favorite memory. Man, you make me want to fly. <laughs> and I've never been in that camp, but now I want to fly. That is very awesome. Like, especially you have the environmental situation of being in the cockpit with Samuel's fire. Mm -hmm. Like that's a once in a lifetime opportunity people yeah. don't get to see, but then also taking off on your own too. So you're mixing all the best of all worlds, right? That's that's a great experience. Um, did you ever have an inspiration or who inspired you the most across your career as you were going through all these and experiencing all these different events? Well, when I was joining the Air Force, um, you know, like I said, I really wanted to fly fighters. The people who inspired me the most to join and fly were really the WASPs from World War II. They were an amazing group of women and, and really didn't cr get credit for their contribution to military aviation until the last several years. So they're one of the big reasons why I wanted to join the Air Force. But once I was in the Air Force, it was really 
the generation of women who were just in front of me. So General Tally Lovett, who is uh, down at AETC now as the A3. She was a flight commander in my squadron when I was a lieutenant. What an incredible, incredible role model to have in front of you. Um, other women like uh, Sharon Pressler, who was the first F-16, female F-16 pilot, and really those that were just ahead of me, uh, paving the way for women to fly fighters in the Air Force. Okay. And would you say it's easy to reach out to some of your mentors and then maybe for your people you mentor to reach out to you and just have that community right now in the Air Force? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and when I was a young lieutenant, there were so few of us. We didn't have as much of that support. And about 10 years into my career, uh, a few of my friends who were instructor pilots down at Luke were feeling the same. They said, you know what, we need, we need to get together across the board. So we actually started a group called the Chick Fighter Pilot Association. Um, and even now, most of the women that are flying fighters are, are part of that organization. And it's really about um, support. Um, you know, we started out talking about how do you pee in the airplane? Sure. Yeah, it, it sounds like it would be a simple thing. Um, but even now, 24 years later, we have an AFWORKS initiative to see if we can get this right. Because it sounds like an easy problem, but it's not. Uh, ensuring that we have equipment that fits us, and there are some uh, there are some issues that are specific to women in aviation that sometimes just don't get addressed at the institutional level. So ensuring that we had that group to kind of uh, bounce ideas off of and, and figure out how to solve our problems was really important. So what's the following like now, 20 plus years later, for that group? There must be quite a few members, right? So there are, but, but interestingly, there aren't as many, uh, there, there's about as many women flying fighters in the Air Force now as there were 20 years ago. Really? So percentage-wise, it hasn't actually gone up. Um, and I know that they're looking at that Air Force-wide, and, and part of it is, do we have role models in the right spots? So do women know that fighter aviation is something that's available to them? So events like the Women in Aviation Week here at Moody is extremely important to get the word out, to let you know, hey, you can do this. You can be a successful officer. You can be a successful pilot. You can be a mom. You can be a, a wife or a spouse if that's what you're interested in. And for my own personal career, I was joint spouse with my husband as an F-16 pilot. Um, we were joint spouse for 18 years. We've been married for 20. He retired about two years ago. And then we have two little girls who are nine and 11. And they are huge proponents of being part of the Air Force family. And you know, you, you probably heard fighter call signs, you know, my husband's is slash, mine is burn. And because we have two little girls, uh, our wing commander at the time when they were born said, you know what, you've got little burns. So he named them Singe and Scorch. That's awesome. Singe and Scorch. Hey, it fits your side too. Yeah, there you that's go. right. Okay. So it's still a tight-knit community then, especially if you're getting call signs for your children. Yeah. That's pretty great. Okay, so what uh, other issues are you seeking to tackle with uh, that group as well? So, Anything else? So again, that, it's not an official Air Force organization, so it's more of a, a support network. Uh, but a lot of what has come out of that uh, goes to the women's initiative team that's working up at Headquarters Air Force. They've had a lot of success in the last couple years with, uh, with women's uniforms. Um, they are part now of the BAR system, which is what we use in TACP, the Battlefield Airmen Replenishment System. And they have female-specific aviator uniforms that are in a warehouse, so it's easier to get to them. Because for a long time, it was really difficult to actually even order the uniforms that you needed to fit. And um, so that's really what we're looking at. If, if you see the initiatives coming out of Air Force Materiel Command to ensure that we remember that one size doesn't actually fit all in the Air Force, so we're looking at sizes, we're looking at height waivers for women to be able to, to get into aviation. And even the fact that I'm sitting here wearing a ponytail today lets us know that we're really trying to figure out how do we be more inclusive in the Air Force so we can capitalize on the talent pool that we have and really get that diversity of thought that we're after so that we can innovate for the future. It just being like that mouthpiece and vocalizing all those different uh, issues, that's really like the first step before they're going to get fixed. So that's, that's great. Yeah, we have a wonderful network of, of aviators that are doing that. Okay. 
Well, that's good to hear. I know our audience would love to hear that as well. Um, so that is a challenge, right? Being able to vocalize the issue of women in the Air Force. But back to you, what would you say is probably the biggest challenge you face in your career? Oh, that that's a great question and a hard one. Um, and, you know, for me, I try and keep a positive attitude about everything. And so I've had challenges along the way, um, but there, it's kind of everyday challenges and it's each target that I put in front of me. So, you know, when I was in navigator school, my biggest challenge was getting through my next check ride. And then once I got to the Strike Eagle, my biggest challenge was making sure that I passed that course. Um, so across the board, I haven't had extreme difficulties. It's just every day coming in with a, a positive attitude, working hard, and just tackling what ends up in front of me. Finishing what's on your plate right that's, there. That's right. Okay, that's a really good way to think about just daily life. I mean, we all put on the uniform every day, but we have our own challenges, just slicing it small at a time. Yeah. Well, in our wing, we ask our airmen to bring their, their best every day, no matter what that looks like. And if they can do that, then as leadership, we have their back 100%. And you know, that's our philosophy from the wing, but that's how I've always gone through my career. And I bet all those 2,800 plus airmen really appreciate that too. Okay. I like the way you think about that, ma'am. So talking to all your airmen now, and then all the women I know are your influence through this week too, and just everyone in the Air Force who puts on the uniform, what advice would you have to someone who wants to do something different or something new or what you're doing right now? So my advice is don't be afraid of challenges, don't be afraid of anything new, and don't be afraid to fail. I mean, you heard my story. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. It didn't work out for me the first time I tried. And although it wasn't how I planned my life to turn out, it's the best way it could have gone. So come in every day, have a great attitude, don't stop reaching for the stars. Um, and if stuff doesn't turn out the way that you expect it to, make the best of what you've got uh, and then make a new plan. Come on, great attitude, make a new plan, keep attacking every day. That's right. Ma'am, if you have anything else you'd like to talk about, all I know is I really appreciate your time and everything you've had for us. And this is gonna be great start for Women Aviation Week here at Moody. Well, I definitely appreciate your time and, uh, and you know, it's, it's great for an old fighter pilot to sit down and, and tell stories about uh, back in the day. Uh, lucky for me, I still get to fly on the civilian side, so uh, I get to stay connected to aviation and that's one of the things that, that keeps me happy. I don't realize sometimes how grumpy I get about not flying until I get back in the airplane and I get airborne on a beautiful blue sky day and I'm like, you know what, this is what life is all about. When was your last flight? Uh, a couple weeks ago. So. Okay, so is that like within the good time frame or are you trying <laughs> yes. to come up on the air? Yeah, so um, so we're lucky enough, my husband and I actually own our own aircraft. We have okay. a uh, Bonanza A26, and so we get to go fly when we when we want. So. That's great. Yeah. On your own time, that's fantastic. That's right. Okay, well, thanks again, ma'am. And I know everyone's been looking forward to hearing these interviews, so appreciate it again. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you.